I want to thank uh, Francesca and Alessandro and the other organizers for inviting me to uh, speak to you and present our data. Uh, let's see if we can, I guess this is good enough. So um, I'm going to tell you about some of our recent mouse work uh, and our brain organoid models to study PCDH19 uh, epilepsy. So um, Stefka nicely introduced um, the concepts of cellular interference, uh, where basically um, when you have wild type cells interacting with wild type cells, they integrate normally. If it's all mutant cells, they integrate normally, but the problem is when there's wild type cells and mutant cells and they uh, segregate, the so-called cellular interference uh, hypothesis. So we also wanted to study this in mice and see if we could model it uh, with brain organoids. Um, Stefka also showed you the elegant data from Paul Thomas, um, where he combined uh, wild type uh, HA tagged uh, mice with knockout and found um, this cell sorting uh, phenotype in the developing uh, cortex, where you have wild type cells and knockout cells that don't uh, intermingle versus uh, all wild type cells that do intermingle. We uh, used a similar strategy recently, um, and this consists of having uh, a, a GFP label on the X chromosome and crossing a male with a GFP on the X chromosome with PCDH19 knockout mice so that you have a wild type chromosome that's labeled with GFP and a knockout that's unlabeled. And you can see here, uh, there's a segregation where you have the wild tape cells in green that don't uh, mix with the knockout cells that just show the nuclear label. Um, so uh, we're looking in more detail, and this is uh, recent data. So um, Hisashi Umamori generated the knockout mice. He's in uh, Boston Children's Hospital, and S Sundeep Kalantri at Michigan uh, gave us the XGFP mice, and these are data from Julie Ziobro, a postdoc in the lab and also a pediatric epileptologist. So Julie looked at E12.5, and similar to what Paul found, we see uh, segregation uh, in the cortex and also in the hippocampal analog. So this is a posterior section. We see it in the ganglionic eminence. Um, and uh, here's the lateral ganglionic eminence. This uh, is the medial and caudal ganglionic eminence. And here you can see it uh, more nicely when it's just the GFP. So um, it's happening early uh, during development. And uh, we also see it in the hippocampus, as Stefka showed, uh, especially in CA1. So here's wild type CA1 uh, where the cells are mixed. Um, but uh, with the GFP cross with the knockout, you can see knockout cells and wild type cells that are uh, segregating. And interestingly, we don't see that in CA3 or the dentate gyrus. It's um, more consistent in CA1. So um, Julie is starting to look at seizures in the mice um, and it's early days. Uh, this is a 45 day old mice and she tested with uh, pentaline tetrazol to look at seizure threshold. And this is a modified uh, Racine scale uh, with mild seizures and more severe seizures. And this is time from injection. And uh, in red are the mixed wild type and knockout and the controls are in black. And to our surprise, we saw um, increased latencies, so suggesting seizure resistance. Um, we don't know uh, why that is. Um, and uh, moving forward, our plan is uh, to look at younger mice. A, a 45 day old mouse is more like a young adult, a juvenile or young adult mice, mouse, and to test hyperthermia induced seizure models and look for spontaneous seizures. So, um, but I'd be curious to hear if anyone uh, has any suggestions why we see increased uh, seizure latency. So, um, Mice are not small humans, as uh, my collaborators like to say, and there are a lot of differences in brain development between mouse and human. In mouse, it takes uh, about six days for the period of neurogenesis uh, during brain development. In a human, it's closer to 100 days. 
There's the obvious difference in size and gyral pattern. Um, there's also an expanded subventricular zone in the human um, stem cell niche, and outer radial glia are a big part of that stem cell niche that form the superficial cortical layers uh, that mice don't really have a major population of. So can we model this in uh, 3D in humans? And the answer is, uh, yes, we can now that uh, human brain organoid technology has been developed. And uh, basically, you take uh, embryoid bodies in most protocols and grow them in suspension in a bioreactor, and you get um, neuroectoderm and then uh, cerebral tissue. And um, uh, a number of groups have uh, used this approach. This is one of the first studies that popularized the approach from Lancaster and Noblick. And uh, what's nice about this approach is it makes many different types of brain tissue. So here's cortical stem cells, here's cortical neurons, um, but it makes a hippocampal onlaga, um, choroid plexus, it can make retina. Uh, so that's uh, a good thing about the approach. Um, what's bad about the approach is it makes all these different tissue and it's very inconsistent from time to time. So there have been um, newer approaches that have used patterning molecules uh, to develop um, more consistent uh, multi-rosette organoids. And these are some of them that we've adopted in uh, our lab. So we've been using about five different techniques to uh, make organoids, trying to figure out which, which is the best approach. So um, uh, CC, a former grad student in the lab, used the Noblick approach. Uh, we went to Hongjin Song's lab and used something called Spin Omega, where he mini miniaturized the bioreactors and tested a lot of different media and came up with uh, a way to, uh, where there's good survival, they're consistent, they make markers of all six cortical layers. Uh, we use Sergio Pasca's cortical spheroid approach. Um, I did a sabbatical at UCLA in Ben Novich's lab to learn his fusion approach, which is really interesting. So you pattern toward excitatory cortex in one organoid and toward inhibitory ganglionic eminence that makes the interneurons in another, and you fuse them together. And just like normal brain development, the interneurons migrate uh, into the excitatory organoid and form uh, connections. And this is very useful for looking at the physiology in the organoids, especially if you want to study uh, epilepsy. And then uh, what I'm Adesso oggi mi concentrerò su una nuova tecnica per fare degli organoidi che sono stati sviluppati nel mio laboratorio e sono delle rosette sferoidali auto-organizzate. Queste sono le singole rosette e vediamo che invece nelle altre tecniche abbiamo ottenuto più rosette. Ed è difficile quantificare questi sottili cambiamenti strutturali a livello di neurorosette che sono proprio l'origine del, della cellula staminale e ci sono tanti altri articoli che vanno a vedere quali sono le parti degli organoidi che sono mostrate e poi qui vediamo che parte del problema è che queste tecniche partono a livello 3D, sono corpi 3D e, e qui vediamo che nel caso dello sviluppo neuronale normale si parte a livello di bidimensionale, di struttura bidimensionale, dopodiché vediamo la formazione del tubo neuronale. E quindi Andrew ha utilizzato questo tipo di tecnica, la SOSR, e qui vediamo come vengono codificate le cellule staminali in progenitori staminali e vediamo anche questo che ci consente di unmode and these are very consistent in size and uh, he, co uh, he placed them in 96 wells in gel tracks and uh, my movie's not working. Oh uh, no, it's not gonna work. Ah, oh, bummer. Okay, anyway, they round up and form these very consistent single uh, rosette organoids and this movie's not gonna work either. Oh, bummer. Um, anyway, they grow, uh, they grow at about uh, a micron per hour, and you can see uh, by day 35, they're already over uh, 800 microns. Um, and uh, they're making very consistent organoids, and if he patterns them toward an excitatory fate, uh, they have the, this single uh, apical lumen um, that uh, labels with 
uh, luminal markers like NCAT heron and PKC. Uh, the uh, stem cells express Nestin and PAC6. By day, this is day eight. By day 22, they start making uh, immature neurons labeled with double cortex. Um, you can see the NCAT heron in the middle of the double, cort double cortin, the new neurons are on the outside. And by day 42, uh, this is the stem cell region that expresses PAC6, and they have markers of deep and superficial cortical layers, CTIP2 and SATB2 and HOPX, which is this uh, marker of outer radial glia that are uh, more primate specific and not seen in rodents. Uh, Andrew can also pattern them to make inhibitory progenitors. Uh, so they express inhibitory stem cell markers, NKX 2.1 and OLIG2. And by day 56, they're making inner neurons that express GABA and uh, somatostatin. And we're doing uh, fusions uh, where he fuses the two and uh, the inner neurons migrate in uh, as a way to make true kind of uh, more human-specific networks that have both excitatory and inhibitory neurons. So we wondered if we could apply this to PCDH19, this method, uh, and uh, Wei Nu and Sandra Mojico Perez in my lab uh, uh, took Andrew's technique, and what Wei did is she made CRISPR knockout uh, human pluripotent stem cells. And the idea is, you know, for several years we've been studying uh, patient cells, uh, reprogramming fibroblasts into pluripotent stem cells. The problem is uh, X um, inactivation um, continues often in the induced pluripotent stem cells, so you don't reactivate. So you can either get uh, all mutant cells, or more commonly you get all wild type cells, and you can't do the experiments. Even if it does reactivate, uh, and then inactivate as you differentiate the cells. In any given culture, you don't know the percentage that are wild type or mutant, and you can't control that. So it's, it's, it's a hard model to study using patient material. Instead, if you make CRISPR knockouts, you can uh, mix the knockout with the wild type uh, in whatever ratio you want. And m most of what I'll show you is 50-50 uh, ratio um, to model the disease that way. So uh, the idea is that if we uh, label uh, wild type cells green and mix them with red wild type cells, they'll integrate normally. If we label mutant cells green and red and mix them, they'll integrate normally. But if we label mutant cells green and wild type cells red, they will uh, sort and not uh, interact properly. And so does that happen? So this is uh, mixing wild type with wild type, or red and green, and you see nice uh, mixing. With knockout with knockout, you see nice mixing, but when you mix uh, wild type with knockout, they segregate. So you get these stripes of wild type cells and stripes of knockout cells. It's really uh, quite uh, impressive. And she's done this about four different times, uh, so we're really excited. Um, we actually tried it with Hong Jin Song's uh, spin omega organoid method, and it uh, was less obvious. So the saucers really uh, helped with this. So what else happens? So uh, Wei also tagged wild type cells, uh, tagged PCDH19 with HA, just like Paul Thomas did in the mouse, and mixed them with the knockout. And here uh, you see when we mix wild type with wild type, the NCAT heron uh, is highly expressed at the apical lumen, uh, just like the HA, labeling PCDH19. It's in the processes, but not so much. But when we mix uh, knockout with wild type, uh, there's only HA where there's knockout cells. I mean, I'm sorry, where there's wild type cells, not where there's knockout. And you can see in those areas, uh, the HA is more diffuse compared to the control uh, throughout the uh, cells. These are radioglial cells uh, that send processes basally. And the NCAT heron uh, localization is misregulated as well. She looked at early neurogenesis. So this is. Uh, these are all 20-day uh, organoids, so they start making neurons pretty early. And uh, CTIP2 is the first marker of deep layer neurons. Uh, TBR1 is another similar marker. And in the wild type, wild type mix, you get a nice uh, lamina of uh, CTIP2. This is, uh, so these are sectioned of frozen organoids, and this is um, the outside kind of coming into the lumen in a different plane. Uh, so ignore the inside, but the outside, you see CTIP2 in a nice lamina, 
When you mix uh, wild type with knockout, you see expansion of this lamina. It's disorganized uh, compared to the control. And we think this is either premature differentiation phenotype or abnormal migration of these firstborn neurons. Now, what happens with uh, male cells? So here's a couple of more examples. Um, this is uh, with our EVOS microscope where the cells are still living, so it's uh, very much lower resolution than the confocal images I showed you. But mixing uh, uh, unlabeled wild type, female wild type with uh, GFP labeled female wild type, uh, you see mixing. When you have female wild type with labeled female knockout, you see uh, this uh, pinwheel pattern. And the same thing happens with uh, female wild type uh, mixed with a male CRISPR knockout. But uh, indeed, when we look uh, at uh, confocal sections, it may be even more severe with the male uh, knockout. Half of this is the female wild type, and the other half is the male knockout compared to um, normal mixing in the control suggesting potentially we can model mosaic males uh, and a more severe phenotype with this uh, approach. So um, the uh, model we have is that um, when you have the same adhesive properties, when they're all wild type or all, they're all mutant, they form uh, a normal uh, cortical uh, layering. Um, but when there's differential adhesive properties, they self-segregate and the early born neurons uh, do not migrate appropriately and there's altered localization of PCDH19 and NCAD heron. And uh, with that, I'll just summarize uh, our uh, heterozygous knockout uh, uh, female mice that model PCDH19 related epilepsies show a cell segregation phenotype. The brain organoid model shows the similar cell segregation as well as abnormal NCAD heron and PCDH19 localization and altered neuronal patterning. And I think combining uh, the two, the brain organoid and the mouse model, should offer a powerful approach to look at seizure mechanisms and to test uh, drugs in these models to better understand PCDH19 related epilepsy. So I will uh, end there and just acknowledge uh, the people that did the work and the support. So the um, organoid data, Andrew Tidball generated the model. Um, Wei Nu and Sandra Mojico Perez did the PCDH19 mixing along with Lou Deng. Uh, Julie is working on the mouse model, and Cece is the grad student who started the PCDH19 work uh, in the lab. And I, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, NCM Parallel Recirca PCDH19, uh, as well as the PCDH19 Alliance for, start, for uh, funding us to start this work. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>